there's a place in Bristol called Noel West. I don't know if any of you have known it or have been there. It's a council estate that has the third worst education record in the country. And the week before I visited it, the bus routes had all been stopped as well. About two years ago, a tenacious and some people thought completely insane local councillor decided that what Noel West really needed in the absence of proper education and proper public transport, not many shops and not very uh, hospitable living conditions, was a media centre. And I think it's pretty safe to say that quite a lot of the rest of the council thought that this particular council was completely barking. But what was extraordinary, and what I saw firsthand, was exactly to Rory's point about what he saw happening in Kenya, that although the media centre wasn't suddenly going to provide a panacea and a route out of all of the problems, some really incredible things were happening. And I'm going to tell you about one person called Mill Lusk that I met, who was probably about a 65, maybe 70-year-old uh, lady who loved gardening. And she was absolutely sick of the fact that all through Noel West, for the entire time that she lived there, Fridges, prams, old bits of metal would pile up high in the front of people's council homes. And she thought, you know, screw this. this is, I'm just sick of this. I am going to encourage people to clear their gardens. And when she saw the media centre being built, she thought, OK, I've got a better idea. I'm going to encourage the kids in Noel West to do a multimedia project, because that kind of sounds sexy and exciting. But actually, I'm going to teach them how to grow vegetables. And I'm going to get them to... Uh, change the entire landscape of Noel West under the guise of a multimedia project. Now, can you hear me now? Maybe you've missed the entire beginning of that story, so you don't know what I'm talking about. Never mind, I'm going to carry on. Um, and so she managed to find about 150, 200 school kids who she encouraged to clear the gardens of the people who had piled up the fridges and the bits of pram and the bits of old metal. And an incredible thing started happening. The kids started learning about how to cultivate green spaces and they started working with the older people on the estate who were living in the houses and together they were learning lots of new skills from each other. The kids were taking photographs of the carrots and the leeks and the potatoes that they were growing where the, the fridges and the uh, prams had been piling up and the old people, older people were learning about how to use the technology that the kids were recording all of this project on. Now there are about 500 kids in this area working with about 250 older people, all of whom are growing vegetables, all of whom are building websites around those uh, incredible things that they're growing and selling them back to the local community. Not necessarily what you would have thought of when you had imagined a media centre in the middle of this pretty deprived area. But it was extremely humbling and inspiring and certainly completely clarified to me why it really matters about spreading technology. Not because we all think we're right and that things we use should be spread to people that don't have them, but because the power that it can unlock for local communities to have a voice and to work together in a way that was difficult before seemed to me quite extraordinary. As Rory said, one of the first things I did uh, when I took on the role of digital inclusion champion, as I have said just before to these guys, the acronym of which did not escape the, uh, the, the amusement of my friends. Um, we pinned down some numbers because there are lots of numbers bandied about, but what we can be sure of is that 10 million people have never used the internet. And of those, 4 million are the most economically disadvantaged. And they're the people that I was asked by the government to look at. You know, great if we can pick up some other people along the way, but our mission is really to focus on what interventions, public, private, charitable, could really focus on those 4 million. Of those 4 million, about 39% are over 65, 38% are unemployed, and 19% are families with children. And I'm sure Tanya will talk more about that particularly important group of the three. But, you know, why does it matter? Why does it really matter, beyond the kind of anecdotal stories of Mill and many other mills around the country? Well, like you, I'm sure today, I got up, I actually went to Walking Sticks to You, one of my favourite websites, and bought a couple of dashing new websites for the party Christmas season. I did a big shop online for groceries, otherwise there'd be no food in my house. I checked out uh, the profiles of the eminent other two panellists just to make sure I wasn't going to get tripped up by something shady in their past. I looked at um, 
photos of my very darling nephew as he has just begun to walk. And I did a big bunch of research um, about some people that I'm looking at recruiting, interestingly enough. The whole new dimension of looking at photos of potential employees online is quite interesting. Um, and that's just a pretty normal morning, as well as, you know, a barrage of emails and Twitter and all the rest of it. And I don't think it's really fair or right that there are 10 million people, 4 million of whom are also disadvantaged in many other ways, that don't have the choices that I get every day by being able to use the internet. I'm with France on this one, who recently ruled that the access to the internet is a basic human right. And even better than that, Finland have just decided that it will be law that every citizen will have access to the internet. I can't remember the exact time frame, but I think it's within the next two years. And that's something for which I believe we should all strive. I believe in the kind of social and moral imperative in doing this stuff. But there's also a hard economic case. And one of the things that we pinned down as a team when first started doing this role was trying to convince people, if I can't convince them uh, from the goodness of their Holtz, souls and because of a more equal society, perhaps we could convince them just with brutal numbers. And I'm sure you maybe know some of them, but I'm going to whiz through them. People save on average £560 a year if they're online, and even the poorest families save £270. And that's not to be sniffed at, especially in these times. If you are able to use the web, you are 25% more likely to get a job if you're unemployed. And if you're in that job, you will be likely to earn between 7 and 10% more than somebody who doesn't have web skills. Now, all of that can be extrapolated out to make some pretty big numbers for UK PLC, if you like. In addition, people's feelings of loneliness go down by 80% when they're online, and their confidence goes up by 60%. Again, when you're talking about some of the most disenfranchised and excluded groups in society, those are interesting and important numbers. But it's not just actually the individual for whom there is a compelling economic case. There's also a strong economic case for government. And this is something I've got increasingly obsessed by. I think when they put me in the role, they thought that I'd just kind of smile and say, aren't you doing a brilliant job? Carry on. Actually, I've become more and more vociferous about some of the things that I think government could be doing to help with this issue. Particularly when we worked out that if the 10 million people who have never used the internet were to move one of the interactions that they have with the government from either a telephone call or a face-to-face -face interaction or a brochure, piece of paper, just one, and on average in a year you have about 13, the government could save 900 million pounds per annum. Now, I'm pretty simple when it comes to numbers, but I cannot believe that it would cost that much more than 900 million to get the remaining people online that are not. So you've got a pretty good economic case for government in year one. So why don't people take up the technology if it's so bloody marvellous and so many incredible things get unlocked when you do so? Well, there's four big reasons, I think. The first is accessibility. You don't know how to get it. You aren't near it. You haven't got broadband. You aren't near a broadband connection. You're in a rural area. The second is affordability. You don't actually have the money, or more importantly, perhaps, you think you can't afford it. The third is skills, training, you don't know how to. And obviously, as technology becomes more entrenched, that actually turns into fear. And very often, people I've talked to said, I said I didn't want it because I was actually quite frightened of it. And when people showed me how to use it, then it became less frightening. And perhaps most importantly, or the thing that I feel increasingly is the area that uh, I can perhaps work on, is motivation. Encouragement about why is it something that people should pay attention to. So, you know, those are the, the four broad reasons I'd have said. And what can we do about them? Well, I'm an optimist, and the good news is that I really think we have an opportunity to create a big social shift in this country and to enable all of the people who do not have access to technology or maybe not thought it's for them or thought it's important that it's in their lives to use technology. And I'm going to suggest three things that I think are important. They're not the only things, but I think they're three important things. The first is that when I started in the summer, I thought, I'm going to have to come up with some clever ideas, so I'm going to have to invent some stuff, but not at all. Everything is happening. Every single idea is being carried out somewhere in this country, either at a local level, at a charitable level, through private companies doing things. Every single good idea is happening. 
We're just not very good at scaling them up and joining them up. I think we're not very clever sometimes about moving things from a local or a micro level to a national level, replicating the best things, and let's face it, sometimes just stopping the less good things. So one of the things that I want to try and do is join up some of the projects that are going on in a more coherent way. The second thing, and it's blooming obvious when you say it, is that really this is no more complicated than peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and training. People that have never used technology or who have recently learned how to use it all say the same thing. When somebody showed me, but not just anybody, somebody that I trusted that was like me, then it became something that I was interested in. And having now been to many, many projects in lots of different places, that seems to me the baseline. That if you have a friend, a colleague, a neighbor, somebody who shows you, who's recently had a transformational experience, that's the most compelling thing. It's not have to be much more complicated than that. So I really want to try and encourage peer-to-peer -peer training, networking, volunteering, all of the things that will unlock that incredible uh, ability for people to show others what's in it for them. And the final thing, which I think might be the bit that the government don't uh, quite want to hear about so much at the end of my tenure, is I think that there is a real opportunity for the government to come in and move certain services so that they are only available online. And I think that by switching off certain services in the same way that uh, the analog to digital television switchover has been happening, there could be a real opportunity to carry along the people that have not yet used technology. Now that might sound kind of overly paternalistic, nanny state, but if you refer back to the 900 million of cost savings for just one interaction, I would argue that in these times more than any other, that's a number government really has to take seriously. The government's got these amazing networks. They've got UK online centres, this incredible uh, network of places where you can go to learn how to use computers that are often in the most deprived communities. They've got the Home Access Program, which works with some of the poorest families to give technology to them and to work um, to make sure that children aren't left out of having access to computers. Using those two networks, expanding them, ramping them up, combined with turning off some services, I think could provide a really valuable intervention by government. But the thing I think, if you look at those three areas, so joining up the best, peer-to-peer -peer training and potential government intervention, the thing I think is really important is that we don't get a bit diverted by the kind of nirvana of super-fast broadband. I worked in Korea for a period of time. It was an extraordinary experience. I worked for three months in a basement with 22 men. And it was also actually, incidentally, where I grew to have my love of karaoke. One of my uh, crazy other businesses at the minute is a private room karaoke business because that's what they love doing in Korea. And this was the point at which they were rolling out their hugely fast and very expensive fiber optic network. And lots of people now say, oh, if only we were like Korea here in the UK. But I don't think it's that complicated because actually if you look at levels of engagement in Korea, it's not much better than it is here. It's not actually enabled some of the most economically disadvantaged people in their society to have access to technology and learn about it and use it. And I think it's that engagement and understanding what that engagement means and understanding what being online means that is the really important part. Of course, super fast access is fabulous if you've got it, but I don't think we should be tripped up by only worrying about infrastructure. There's a lot we can do without it. So yes, I believe there is a digital divide, but even worse than that, we're creating a social and digital divide for the people that are already the most excluded. But yes, I think we can really do something about it. And the time is now to do that, to get political momentum, bring together all of the projects that are happening all over the country. And I'll just leave you with one final story. I was in Leeds at a project working with young people who had been uh, either recently in prison or in care, um, or often both. I met a young man called Daryl, and uh, he really made me check how I think about technology, because I don't know about you, but I frequently think, oh, I'd just die without my iPhone. I just wouldn't be able to survive. And he looked at me and he said, I would be dead if I didn't know how to use the internet. And I kind of fell a bit quiet, and I said, why do you say that, Daryl? And he said, because... I left prison and I had a very bad heroin problem and I was found in a bus stop, comatose, and I didn't really have any 
particular motivation to do anything. And somebody took me to this project in Leeds where they teach young people how to learn to make music on the internet. And now I come here every day and I've made some tunes and I'm selling them on iTunes. I'm making a small amount of money, but it's given me a real reason to go on and to believe that I can do something. Now, there are a million Daryls all over the world, but there are several million here in the UK. And I really hope that we can all work together to make sure there are fewer of them. Thank you.